and we are live. Well, hey folks, welcome to my Friday Q&A sessions. I'm going to do five questions here, but if you have one, add it to the uh, comments below and I will try to get to that or add it for next week. I trust you well. Recording this on Friday, let's see, I believe it's the 29th. Check that. Yeah, 28th, beg your pardon, of um, what month are we? Of January. And uh, we have a snowstorm blowing in this evening. So stay warm, stay safe if you are here in New England. And a um, few housekeeping things as always. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to my YouTube channel. Do check out the links below. And uh, we have a daily video out now that's also out as a podcast. I also have some online courses. Um, this weekend, I'm going to be offering 50% off my course on Revelation. That's not on the book of Revelation, but on actually how to receive revelation from God. The Apostle Paul said, I went up by revelation. And I think God wants us to live a life where we live by revelation more than information. So a lot of good things there. And lastly, as always, our email newsletter. Um, subscribe, look at that, and uh, we get a, we give a free gift, an audio teaching to everybody who subscribes for that. So check out the links below. Boom. Well, I've got five questions today. Uh, let me run through these real quick, and then we'll begin. The first one is, what do we do about doubts? What do we do when we doubt? The second one is, what are spiritual gifts? Third question is, how can I learn to hear from God? The first question is, why does God allow evil in the world? And the fifth question today is, is the Bible reliable? So let me jump on into these. Good. First one then. My first question is, Graham, what do we do when we doubt? Um, and it's a really great question. And let me take a few minutes and just unpack this. I would say this firstly, uh, don't condemn yourself when you doubt. Everybody's going to have doubts at times. If you think about it, Jesus had doubts. <laughs> Some evangelicals' brain is exploding right now, but not their heart. And um, here's the point. When Satan came to Jesus and said, if you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, if you're the Son of God. That's, what, that's all a doubt is. Satan was trying to get Jesus to doubt God's word. Satan came to Adam and Eve and said, hath God said? He came to Jesus, if you will, and said, hath God said? And Jesus said, yes, God hath said, it is written, it is written, it is written. So there's nothing wrong with having doubts. And all of us, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to have doubts about big things and smaller things. And um, I, I want to <clears throat> really want to begin there by saying, don't condemn yourself. Don't feel, oh, Graham, I'm, you know, not functioning well as a Christian because I have a doubt. There's nothing wrong in having doubts. And I'll end with this uh, thought today. But, you know, if we can learn to deal with doubts well, doubts actually become a really great thing. Doubts can upgrade our walk with God when we learn to respond to them well. Good. So what happens uh, when we have doubts? Let me just say this as well. Just because you have doubts doesn't mean that you don't have faith. So it's possible to have very real faith. If you think about it, when Peter walks on water, it's about Matthew 11 or 12. Jesus is walking on water. Peter sees him. Peter says, can I walk on water too? Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Peter gets out the boat and walks on the water. If you will, Peter's walking on the word of God, the word come. He's literally walking on the word. And then he looks at the wind and the waves it's like the sensory inputs which tell him it's not a good day to walk on water, as if there's any good day to walk on water. And Peter, the Bible says he begins to sink. He doesn't sink like a stone, he begins to sink. And then when they get back into the boat, Jesus said to Peter, why did you doubt? The word doubt in the Greek and the, the Latin as well, it comes from the, the root word to. You know, in French we'd say de, un, deux, trois, quatre, one, two, three, four. I think Spanish is dois, is it something like that? But it's the same root, de, dois, duo, doubt. It means to have two thoughts. So I want you to catch this as well. When, when you're doubting, it doesn't mean you have faith. What it means is you have faith, you have God saying this, and you also have something else saying something else. You have two thoughts. Uh, James put it this way in James chapter 1 verse 8. He says, A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways and will not receive from God. 
So how do we how do we get rid of double mindedness? God says this, the wind and the waves say this. God says this, Dr. Fauci says this. God says this, you know, my bank statement says this. God says this, my body says this. God says this, my education. How do we get rid of we don't you don't fight one. What we do is we focus on what God says. That's what Jesus did. When the doubt came in, Jesus didn't go, I bind you doubt, go away doubt, spirit of doubt. He didn't pour oil on the doubt. He didn't bind the generational curse of doubt. He didn't try to get any. He said to the doubt, it is written and reestablished what God said. So how do we deal with doubts? Um, Let me give you two or three quick keys. Number one, we deal with them in the word of God. We, We don't try, as I say, so much to display, to remove them, but we displace them with what God says. We come back to what God says. And here's a real key as well when you're going through doubts. Satan loves to attack us. Doubts attack us in our emotions. So doubts will often present themselves like some intellectual idea. Uh, I don't think that's true. When Peter looks at the wind and waves, he's not having a kind of internal physics conversation about, you know, relative mass and his weight and the capacity of his, the, you know, body to be supported on water or whatever. Straight away, doubts tend to hit us in our emotions. You literally get that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. You know, if you're, if you're waking up at night thinking about some terrible thing, it's usually, it lives in that emotional realm. And the danger is when we're, when we're doubting, we're usually feeling that emotionally. And when we express God's word, we're not usually feeling it. We're not feeling this big boost of confidence and God has said this. It feels very flimsy, very far away. And what we need to do is when we're feeling emotionally those doubts, don't deny the feeling, but rather come back to the word and say, this is what I believe. I may not be feeling it right now, but this is what I believe. Come on, key number two is this. When you're, when you're doubting, sometimes we try to help ourselves when we're doubting or help others by having, again, this informational paradigm, this informational argument about doubts, rather than realizing the key to being free from doubts is relational rather than informational. You know, if a child were the, having horrible thoughts that there's a bogeyman in the corner and I'm scared at night or this, what would a parent do? A parent wouldn't try to have some, well, there are bogeymen. And so what a good parent would do is come and just hug that child and love will drive out fear. And I tell you, there are times when we're going to have doubt that God, that we won't have the answer to, that the Bible doesn't have the answer to, that God won't always come and say no and give us the total plan. Our faith has to be in God, his who he is, the person of God, the veracity of his word, not in the fact that we've grasped everything in our minds. So when you're in doubt, rather than look for an explanation, look for a relationship, look for that, the around of the everlasting arms, look for a Lord who's a very present help in the time of trouble. Boom. Let me finish with this as well when we talk about doubts. Here's a really great thought that's helped me. I used to know a really great preacher in the UK. He liked to say, unbelief is the dark room where you develop your negatives. And he'd often say this as well. He'd say, learn to doubt your doubts. This really helped me with the word of knowledge. This guy said to me years ago that whenever you hear, hear from God, like a word of knowledge, you'll usually hear a very, very still, small, tiny. He would say, it's not even a whisper. It's like a wisp, half a whisper. You hear a very small voice, you know, where God is saying, hey, there's a person here with a broken left foot or whatever. And then straight away, like a boom, like a hurricane, the doubts will come. So God will speak to you and say something. And it's a near guarantee straight away, your flesh or Satan will jump in there with doubts. And the doubts will usually go like this. That's not God. That's me. I made that up. I had that word of knowledge last week in Chicago. Uh, There's nobody here with that. You're going to look really silly when you do that. And um, here's the key. Doubt your doubts. What I've learned to do is when God's speaking to me and then suddenly, bang, 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 doubts come. I go, thank you, devil. You've just confirmed it really was God. Thank you, devil. for Thank you, doubts, for reinforcing, reaffirming that I really am hearing from God. And what I've learned to do, I've done this thousands of times over the years. You know, I've never, ever missed it. Um, 
when I've tried this, when those hear from God in a small way, bang, the doubts come very loud, is I use the doubts to confirm it was God and I will do it. And here's the point, even if I'm wrong, I'd rather, even if I'm wrong, I'm right. Because if I think, if I'm, my heart is right and I think I'm hearing from God, and I'm willing to act that out when I could look stupid, but I'm not going to be dictated to by doubts, I win. And I tell you what, guys, God honors that. So learn to, my point is, if you hear a voice saying, oh, God doesn't love you, you know, you will die of cancer, I don't know, some, some thought like that. Don't, don't try to fight it, rather stop. Thank you, devil, for reminding me that he is the Lord, my healer. With long life, he'll satisfy me and show me his salvation. I shall not die, but I will live and declare the works of the Lord. Thank you, devil, for reminding me of this. If every time he hits you with one doubt, you take the word of God, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Then what's actually happening is every doubt pushes you further into what you believe. Doubts actually become a useful thing in your walk with God. It's really worth trying that. Bless you guys. Hope that helps. <coughs> Excuse me. Question number two. I need to be quicker with these. Uh, somebody's asked me the question, what are spiritual gifts? And uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, that term, <coughs> excuse me, kind of depending really um, where you are and who uses that term. The danger is that can, term can mean different things to different people. So in the New Testament, there are usually three quite different categories of things that are sometimes referred to as spiritual gifts. But I know sometimes you'll get um, a lot of evangelical churches who actually deny the Word of God, who deny what the Bible teaches, let's say, about tongues and prophecy, healing, those kind of spiritual gifts. And then to do that, they sort of compensate and buy into a teaching that is much more, frankly, about natural talents, and it's like going through a, you know, a Christian character course to find gifts, and um, you know, they'll sometimes confuse just natural, innate gifting for spiritual gifts. So, I would say this: when we look at the New Testament, there's sort of three areas of spiritual gifting, and they are different, and it is important that we distinguish between them. So, area number one: what most Charismatic Pentecostals would call spiritual gifts are the ones mentioned primarily in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul speaks about nine, I'll get into this later, but anointings, manifestations, if you will, gifts of the Spirit, nine gifts, three, three spoken gifts, three power gifts, and three gifts of discernment. Uh, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, Gift of faith, uh, gifts of healings, plural, working of miracles, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Nine gifts there. Um, there's a second category, if you will, of gifts that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4.11, where it says, Jesus ascended on high and gave gifts to men, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Um, and then there's a third category that Paul uses three times in his epistles where he'll speak more about things like the gift of hospitalities, uh, the gifts of administrations, the gifts of helps, things like that. So in a way, three categories. Let me, let me separate them out this way. I, I would look at these Ephesians 4.11, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. I would look at those more as offices than spiritual gifts. And by that I mean the very person is a gift. <clears throat> and you can't, everybody can't choose to have one of those. It's Jesus who gives them or doesn't give them in an individual's life. And not everybody is an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor or teacher. And when God gives those gifts, they're, like, they're more like a calling. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're like a vocation in somebody's life. And they really refer to, they're like a lifelong calling that has a mission, it has gifting within it and a mandate to do something for God. So if we were to say, <coughs> excuse me, hello, this is Charlie. Charlie's an apostle. We could say he's a spiritual gift to the church. He himself is that gift and the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. When Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 12 about those nine spiritual gifts, if you actually look in the King James or New King James, the word gifts is italicized, which means it actually wasn't really there in the original. It was just added at the discretion of the translators to help make the text flow. Now, I don't mind using the word gifts of the Spirit. The danger is what, what some people have done, what early Pentecostals used to teach, is that 
God, when you when you're baptized in the Spirit, God will give you a gift of the Spirit. Or if you're really lucky, you might get two gifts of the Spirit, or even three. And we've looked at these sometimes as personal possessions. You'll hear people say, "I have the gift of prophecy." I have the gift of healing. And I don't believe anybody has the gift of healing. I don't believe anybody has the gift of prophecy. I believe the gift we have is the gift of Holy Spirit. And then Holy Spirit in us. So I've received the gift of Holy Spirit in me. And when I'm in a, a church service, when I'm in a store, when I'm in ever, he will manifest, he will release those anointings and show himself and heal people and speak and guide and encourage and release those gifts. So I would say this, the gift you get when you're filled with the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's not, you don't own the gift of prophecy, the gift of word of knowledge. Rather, what we do is we learn to cooperate in that gift. So I prophesied thousands and thousands of times in my life, but it doesn't mean I'm necessarily a prophet. What it means is I've learned to cooperate and allow the Lord to flow that gift through me. I don't have a gift of healing. Nobody has a gift of healing. Wake up, baby doll. If, if you believe you do, <clears throat> come with me to the local hospital, please, and demonstrate your gift. Love you, but it's not true. Now, what you have, and I have too, is a capacity to allow Holy Spirit, as he wills, to flow those gifts of healings out of us. And that's actually a really empowering thing. Because it takes all the pressure off you, and you realize you become like a conduit, a pipeline, a bandwidth, that God can flow all of those gifts out. And then lastly, there's that third category of gifts, <clears throat> where Paul talks about things that are we probably recognize a little bit more as natural abilities, gifts of administrations, gifts of helps, gifts of hospitality, where God will really grace people with um, spiritual gifting uh, that, that enables his kingdom to flow, that Paul speaks about every joint in the body supplying that which is lacking in other joints. So I love having people around me who are really good at doing different things that I'm no good at doing it, and I want to bless them and release them into that. So I hope that helps. Those are the three categories of spiritual gifts mentioned in the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me pause. Have a drink of water here. <coughs> How can we learn to hear from God? Question number three. <coughs> so. I would say this, let me give you a few thoughts. Number one, everybody can hear from God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, John 10. Yeah, everybody can hear the voice of God. The, the challenge is not to get God to talk. <laughs> the challenge is to get his people to listen. And I think in some way, the real danger is we've, we've so lost the plot with this concept of hearing from God that... I think what we should do is we should take baby Christians from day one and say, you can hear from God, begin to learn to hear from God, begin to practice. I don't mean try to hear and tell other people what to do and go and prophesy over the president, but I mean learn, keep asking God questions, keep listening. And we, at times what I think the church has done is we've gone to younger believers and we've said, it's dangerous to hear from God, you could make mistakes. Rather, you come and rely on me, Mr. Pastor. And I'm a pastor, so I understand that desire to keep people safe. But we don't, we actually keep people safe when we say, lean not on your own understanding and let the Lord direct your path, learn to lean on Him. So, so number one, I'd say this, everybody can hear from God. Number two, you know, in the Old Testament, there were certain people, the prophets, if you will, that would hear from God. A New Testament prophet would hear from God for the people. So, excuse me, an Old Testament prophet would hear from God for the people. A New Testament prophet, the primary role of a New Testament prophet is not to hear from God for you. The primary role of a New Testament prophet is to help you develop your spiritual relationship so you can hear from God. It's really important that one is. So how do we practice this? How do we improve this? Um, let me get, I've got some teaching, lots of teaching on this online, but I'll give you a few quick thoughts today. Number one, to start with humility, you're going to get this wrong. Everybody I know who does this gets it wrong at some stage. I have done, will do again probably. And having that walk of humility that says, I can hear from God, God does speak to me, but I'm still a learner. In the UK, we put L plates, you know, a, a, literally a large red, a white 
sticker with a large letter L on learner drivers for the first year, you know, or when they're driving, you know, is to let everybody else around them know this is a learner. They might make a few mistakes. You might want to give them a bit more space or a bit more grace as they learn. And I think we should all have L plates on us as we hear from God. Yeah, never take your L plate off. Yeah, if you take your L plate off, I'll put a P plate on you and P-R-I-D-E plate. So stay in that place of humility that says we're learning, we can hear from God, but we can make mistakes. And God has given us scriptural backups and fail safes to stop us making some of the silly mistakes we can make. But start in that place of humility. Secondly, just keep practicing. I would encourage you to get a journal every day. And I, I know some people, I've heard some teaching about you close your mind and write or you know, that's just weird. What I mean is get a good cup of coffee, a Bible, a, a journal and pray and say, Lord, what's going to happen to me today? Lord, um, what do you want me to know about this day? And learn to practice hearing and learn to differentiate. And the more you practice, the more you learn to differentiate between your thoughts and his thoughts. It's actually not that hard. You know, let me give you an analogy. For most Christians, and especially younger Christians, though some never mature in this realm, this realm, the voice of God convicting us of sin looks very like the voice of Satan condemning us for sin. Now, why? Because when we're in sin, we're, we're usually all defensive and that, but after a while, you can learn to notice differences in the voice of conviction that comes from above and the voice of condemnation that comes from below. Yeah, And in the same way, I think the more we practice and the more we seek God, the more we can learn to separate soul and spirit, joints and marrow. We can separate what is just my own desires, my own heart, my own imagination, if you will, and what's really coming from God. And then when Satan jumps in, we notice it straight away. So practice, practice, practice. Um, what I would say, key number three as well, is develop a track record, which is why I say get a journal, Try to hear from God every day and then go back and notice, was it God or wasn't it? Rather than try to use your amazing prophetic God hearing abilities to tell other people what to do, start with yourself, build up a track record with yourself, then build a track record with other people and then God will allow you to do that in ministry. You know, as a leader in the body of Christ, one of the most miserable things is I constantly get people trying to give me words, telling me what to do that will cost me time, money, focus, whatever. And they've never earned any credibility. They've never built that track record with me. And I'm really open to that with them. So I would say this, build that personal history, learn to <clears throat> develop, you know, day after day, week after week, year after year, what is God, what isn't God. And I, it's not that hard if you consistently do that. So practice, practice, practice. And um, two more quick keys as well. I could talk on this one for hours, but having faith is a, God speaks to faith. So when you believe God speaking to you, God will speak to you. And when you're in doubt and you believe he doesn't speak to you, he won't speak to you. So having faith is just a real, you know, get into that place of faith. Say, Lord, I believe you speak to me. I believe I can hear your voice. I believe I'm guided. I believe you give me specific things I couldn't possibly know that will open the hearts of men and women. Lord, I believe you're ordering my steps. Engage your faith. And lastly, everything's all about relationship. So we don't want to look at hearing from God in terms of here am I alone on the earth and I'm trying to like get this message from above, like this UFO signal I'm trying to decipher. Rather, when we think we've heard, what we should do is press into relationship. And when we think we've heard from God, move back into relationship, move into the Holy of Holies, move into worship. If I think I've heard from God and it's really me, but I really seek God and I'm more of him and I'm close with him. I'm spending more time in worship than I'm trying to evaluate this word. The things that come from God grow in God's presence. The things that don't come from God shrink in his presence. So again, press into relationship rather than technique. Boom. It's really useful. <clears throat> Good. Question number four. Question number four is, why does God allow evil? And um, I know many people ask this question, and um, 
I, I don't have long to answer it, but it's actually a very, very easy question to answer. For some reason, um, we get this kind of meme put around that this is a really hard question. And I've seen so many Christian leaders say, well, nobody knows the answer to this. I think it's a really, really easy question to answer. People don't always like the answer, but I, I don't think it's a difficult question to answer. So a few quick thoughts on this. Why does God allow evil? Well, number one, I would question the premise of the question. I'm not sure God actually allows evil. I think we allow evil. And when I say we, I mean we as humanity, we as God's children, we as a fallen human race allow evil. So, you know, I, I know every analogy breaks down at a point, but I, I'm living here in Massachusetts. There is a Massachusetts Highway Code, you know, a little book they give people when we learn. If I go and I break every one of those um, driving highway guidelines in Massachusetts, if I drive on the left, as I do in the UK, if I don't stop, if I drive through red lights, if I do that, evil, if you will, an accident will befall me sooner or later. And if I were then to go to the state house in Boston and say, why does the, the governor of Massachusetts allow accidents? You know, he'd probably say, well, we gave you a book with guidelines, Graham, and you consistently broke those rules and you ended up in hospital. And again, I, I, I'm not trying to give an oversimplified thing, but the problem of evil is there's a way that seems right to a man and the end thereof is death. So it's actually our choice, not God's choice. Thought number one. Thought number two, this is really powerful and it's worth thinking through until it sinks down and gets into your, your gut level thinking in a way. Can I say this? If there's no God, people, I've heard people say, well, I can't believe in God because, uh, because why would God allow evil? Okay, help me out here. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe in evil. That is an absolute factual statement. If there is no God, there is no good, and there is no evil. If you are purely a naturalist, a humanist in that sense, somebody like a Sam Harris, uh, Christopher Hitchens, you know, Richard Dawkins kind of thing, you actually, if you're consistent, you don't believe there is good or you don't believe there is evil. Those are simply social constructs we've invented. You know, if I were to say to you that you should drive on the right and you should drive on the left, we should drive on the right because as a social norm we've accepted in America, you should drive on the right. But other countries drive on the left. There's no, maybe there's a country they drive in the middle, who knows, <laughs> around the edges. Um, if there's no God, then good and evil actually don't mean anything. They're simply social norms we've adopted, like where you drive or what clothes you wear or whatever. Now, I don't believe that. I believe there actually is good, there is evil. It's interesting, at the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War, you know, they put people like uh, Goering on trial, you know, Himmler, people like that. And part of the defense that the Nazis used, the Nazis would say to the British, Canadian, French, and Russians who were trying them, the, the allies, if you will, what right do you have to try us and condemn us for what we did as Nazis? And the Nazis, you look at the records, they actually said this, they'd say, this is victor's justice. What the Nazis would say is, you guys won the war, you've captured us, you, you have your policemen, you can kill us, you can hang us, but don't pretend that you're morally superior to us. And the Nazis said in their defense, they'd say, look, we had German law, and you guys have British, American, French, British, Canadian, Russian law, whatever. They'd say, you guys, you were stronger militarily, but don't pretend your law is any more moral than our law. And what the Supreme Judge, he was an American there at the time, said, he was very wise, he said, you're right saying there's a British law and a French law and a German law and a Russian law, but above all of those laws, there is an objective moral law that God has written through the universe that, that the Nazis broke. Yeah, I want to be really clear on that. So I want you to catch this, there is good, there is evil, but if you don't believe in good, if you don't believe in God, you have no basis on which to say this is good and this is evil. So why does God allow evil? Um, again, pull on the thought, if you know, really think this through. If, if we're saying God should not allow evil, to use your terms of reference there, what does that really mean? 
What we're actually saying is we want to live in a universe. We want to live in a world where it's impossible for, let's just talk about me. It's impossible for me to do something wrong. It's impossible for me to do evil in that sense. I just silence my phone here, it's ringing. What we're actually saying is I want to live in a world where God takes these choices and we have no capacity whatsoever to choose. And to do that is to live in a world where we, we're no longer free moral agents. We cannot take choices. Yeah. Again, if you keep pulling on the thread until the sweater unravels, what we're really saying when we say, why does God allow evil? Is what most of us, we never really thought it through. It sounds such a great cliche to say, but if we're going to really be consistent and think it through, what we're usually saying is, why doesn't God sort out all those people? Why doesn't God sort out my neighbors who are evil? Why doesn't God sort out the people in another country that are oppressing children and hurting people? But what we're not saying is, why doesn't God come into my home and tie me down and stop me doing evil? We're always thinking of other people. So what we're saying is we'd like to live in a world where nobody is able to choose, where we're forced to do that which is good which is like some sort of spiritual North Korea. And God is not, we've, God's made us in his image, made us in his likeness, and he's made us with the capacity to choose. And it's a really important thing that we grasp that. We have the capacity to choose. You know, the very first murder, if you will, Cain and Abel, God came to Cain and said, sin lies at your door. It's like sin is knocking at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And we have that moral capacity to choose. We do. And if you take that away, again, think this through, be consistent. What, what most people are doing when they're saying God, God should stop evil in the world, we're saying God should go and stop the Holocaust. God should stop the genocide in Rwanda. God should stop the Russians invading the Ukraine. But we're not saying God should come to my house and stop me doing any little things that I wink at. God shouldn't talk to me about completely paying my taxes or not lying or not having a lustful thought or doing whatever. And if God came and stopped all evil, none of us would breathe. Yeah. Come on, let me end with this. You know, the real answer, when we say, why doesn't God come and stop this? God is coming and God will stop this. But we're living in a a time of grace right now when that's what the good news is, where God has given men and women, mankind, the capacity to repent. He's given us an out, a way out. And one day God will come and say, time out, stop. And God will judge every single person with a judgment, not a Nuremberg trial, but a divine judgment that we can't even conceive. Yeah. Somebody once put it this way. Imagine, I know it's a horrible thought, but imagine right now you died. I'm sorry. And then you wake up wow, in the afterlife and you find the afterlife is a movie theater. Come on, imagine right now um, you wake up in a movie theater. Wow. And then you're wondering, you're all alone in this movie theater and suddenly an angel shows up with popcorn. And the angel says, great, welcome to the afterlife. What I'm going to do is for the next 80 years, we're going to watch the movie of your life and we're going to see every single thing you did. But hey, we have such great technology. We're not only going to see everything you did. We're going to see every thought you've thought, every emotion, every inclination, everything that's ever happened in your entire life. Every little lustful thing, every lie, everything. We're going to watch it. And you sit there for 80 years with your popcorn, watching the movie of your life, of every thought, whatever. And at the end of it, you're probably like this whimpering <laughs> train wreck, this jellyfish. And the angel comes and says, don't worry, we're going to have a, a second seance. We're going to have a we're going to have a second showing in the movie. But this time we're going to invite all of the players, all of your family, your colleagues, your church companions, your neighbors. Everybody who ever met you is going to fill the movie theater and they're going to watch the movie of your life. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Again, there's one word that strikes to mind for me, repentance. God wants us to repent. So one day, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, when the author puts his feet on the stage, the play is over. And one day, King Jesus, one day soon, King Jesus will return and will judge every person who's ever lived and absolutely will deal with evil once and for all. But right now, we're in a season where 
God is calling men and women everywhere to repent. So you say, why does God allow suffering? You know, if you'll think about it, there's really no other um, way that could happen. And what we are, what we should grasp is God's going to come and resolve this issue. Not with some cute philosophical intellectual argument, but with his presence, with judgment that every person, I believe when God judges humanity, every person in humanity will say, that was fair, that was right. God, you, you, you are the right judge. You judge me correctly, even when our own sin condemns us. And again, the really great news is God's come and he's already paid the price for that judgment. He won't condemn me because he's already allowed his son to take my sins upon himself that I may go free. The question is, what will I do with that offer of gift in Christ Jesus? Boom. And my last uh, question today was, is the Bible reliable? <clears throat> Again, short answer, yes, but um, it is a good question. Um, let me give you a few quick thoughts on this as we close today. Um, I want to say this firstly, I, I love it when people ask questions. I've been around some religious circles where to ask that question, is the Bible reliable? It's like people will throw stones at you or condemn you for even asking the question. And I think, I think it's great that we ask questions. I've asked that question in my life and I believe I've come to the right conclusion. And yet um, I don't think we should be ashamed of asking the question and if we we should encourage questions rather than squash them so is the bible reliable um i would say this really quickly the bible's reliable but sometimes our conception of what the bible is or what we think it is or what we've assumed it to be is not reliable so i think at times what we've done at a very simplistic level somebody's uh, communicated this as if God sat down in heaven with a pen and a paper and wrote a book and sent it to us. And then if you, here's the point, if you look at the Bible there, you're going to find things which appear to be inconsistent between one with another. Rather than understanding what the Bible actually is, the Bible isn't a book. The Bible is a collection of books, Biblia. In French, we'd say bibliothèque, a library. It's a collection of books, 66 books, um, you know, by many different authors stretched over thousands of years that is inspired by God. So rather than looking at this like God actually penned it, God took men, God took women, primarily men here, and... Uh, I believe that we have what God wants us to have. I believe what we have is the Holy Word of God is inspired by God. It's God speaking to us. But at the same time, I know that Moses wrote differently than the Apostle Paul. Peter wrote differently than the Apostle Paul. It's interesting, Peter the Apostle writes about, he mentions Paul's epistles in his epistle, 2 Peter. And he says, when I read Peter's letters, Peter's epistles, they're really hard to understand. And yet, Peter says about Paul's writings, these, these are scripture just as much as the other scriptures. So, it's okay when you're reading through different books to realize there are different personalities who wrote this, that they're speaking in two different contexts, they're speaking from different contexts, that at times their own personality or their own thinking, if you will, is coming through there. You know, Paul writes... Um, is it when he's writing to Timothy or he, he basically, no, he's writing, I think he's writing in Galatians. I must forget the reference to this one. But um, he basically says, God doesn't send me, God didn't send me to baptize people. And then I think he says, I baptize nobody. And then he writes, I think in the next, well, I, I think, you know, I baptized Timothy or his mother who weren't baptized or whatever. And it's like, my point is you've seen a real man um, say real things and write. And he's you know, got his own frustrations. You'll see that in David at times, his own life is coming through the story, his frustrations, his breakthroughs, um, his, his anger at times. God is using real people and through them speaking. So I think we can come to God's word and absolutely believe it. I would say be careful when somebody says there's a contradiction in the Bible, you know, be willing to expand that and say, is this really a contradiction or is that I'm not, I haven't yet harmonized. You know, there are things in the Bible like, you know, it's an old one. People would say there's, there's one of the gospels that says Judas, you know, one of the disciples who betrayed Jesus, he died and his bowels burst open in a field. And, you know, another passage says Judas went out and hung himself. Yeah. Now, 
Which one was it? I harmonize, I take both those scriptures and say they're both true. I think he hung himself and then, you know, his bowels burst out in the field or whatever. It's graphic ex- a thought for you there. You know, there are, in the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Luke, there are two genealogies of Jesus, if you will, the family line of Jesus. And straight away people notice, oh, they're different. They have different characters in them. How can this be inspired? And yet, when you actually look, the Gospel of Matthew is written primarily to Jewish people, and Jewish people trace their lineage through the the mother. Um, When Luke is writing, he's writing primarily to a Gentile audience, and Gentiles trace their lineage, if you will, their parenthood, their ancestry, through their father. So you actually get these two parallel genealogies of Jesus, one that traces it through Mary, one that traces it through Joseph. So when somebody says there's a contradiction in the Bible, sometimes do a little bit more pecking and hunting and looking. Let me give you two quick more thoughts on this as well. I would say this, the Bible's the inspired, inerrant word of God. And yet, absolutely, it's possible to take a scripture out of context, out of the heart of God, and do real harm with it and do silly things with it, and people do that all the time. And what we need is we need the we need to study our Bibles, but we need to be full of the Spirit as well, so we don't just get the letter that kills, we get the Spirit that gives life. Yeah, I'd say lastly that there's a step of faith. You know, Billy Graham, uh, he was the guy who preached the gospel when I gave my life to the Lord back in 1984. And I once heard Billy Graham talk about a time You know, he'd been at Bible school, he'd been at ministerial school in preparation to enter the ministry, and he got around some kind of liberal teachers who were doubting the reliability of the Bible. Billy Graham, you know, he talks about going out for a walk in the woods, and he's got all these questions, and he's just kind of his heart crying out, and he prays, and he's like, God, give me the answer. And it's like the Lord said to him, just take that step of faith and believe this is my word. And Billy Graham, from that moment forward, he said, I'm never going to doubt God's word. I don't understand all of God's word, but I believe the Bible is God's word. And Billy Graham, you know, he literally became famous for preaching. And, you know, the Bible says was his phrase. And I encourage you, you'll never have enough answers, enough explanations to explain every little thing. And every, you know, to read the Bible, sometimes we're reading poetry. Sometimes we're reading history. Sometimes we're reading kind of mythological history that just sums up something in a story. Sometimes we're reading direct things. Sometimes we're reading law. There's different um, genres of literature that make up what we call the Bible. And if you apply the same rule to all of it, you're going to get in trouble. But I would say, take that step of faith and say, this is God's word. And I think when we do that, God will meet us in his word and God will flow. His word becomes a rock on which we will build our lives. Boom. I hope that's been helpful to you guys. Uh, Again, check out some of my links below there. Hit that subscribe button. And I hope to see you soon in the plan of God. Uh, I'll do another Q&A next week, Lord willing. So bye for now.